If you have watched my discussion on the general nature of drugs, we could now proceed to the other important molecule in pharmacology, that is, the receptors. Now, just for a very quick recap, when I discussed the nature of drugs, I did mention that drug molecules must interact with a target. So that means that all the while we were discussing this in one recording, I was only really uh, focusing on our uh, substrate, or sometimes we call it the ligand, which is basically just a fancy word meaning our drug molecule. But we really didn't pay attention to the other partner, which is the one which will receive the drug. Again, we usually call the one on the receiving end as the receptor. So maybe that's also one way you could make sense to why we call these receptors in the first place. Okay, um, Although, uh, in, in, in more advanced contexts, not all targets of drugs are called receptors. There are some that are actually called channels, even pumps. Some of them are enzymes. So that is to say enzyme is not synonymous to receptor. Though, since they are both targets of drugs, sometimes references interchange them. Okay, So let's just uh, take that into consideration. Now, whether we call it a receptor, a channel, uh, an enzyme, they are frequently proteins. There are very rare cases wherein we have uh, drug targets that are nucleic acids or actual chemical compounds, but we will not talk about those rare cases here. Now, since uh, we do have uh, receptors primarily as proteins, do note that there are two main properties that we should always find in receptors. Those are, one, specificity, and two, the capability to elicit a physiologic effect. Now, Specificity is something that, if you have uh, remembered your biochemistry, it's not supposed to be unique because enzymes do have a certain level of specificity, right? An enzyme, uh, going back to our discussions in biochem or your discussion with your, uh, with, your, with your teacher, enzymes cannot accept every single molecule. They can only accept those which are, well, complementary to them or that fit in them. And we apply the same principle to receptors and drugs. Now, the important bit that sh should quite be obvious, but sometimes people forget this, is that a receptor or a drug target must elicit a physiologic effect. That is, let's say I have a certain you know, a receptor here. This receptor must already be doing something on its own, or this enzyme, okay, or this channel. Because... The point is, what if, for example, I have a drug, and let's say this drug's purpose is to block the activity of this one. Would that make sense if this thing right here didn't even do anything in the first place? That basically means the drug is blocking something that's useless, right? So it might be like so obvious for you at this moment, but I'm just clarifying that the drug's targets must be doing something in the first place. Now. With that said, that means that even if there was no drug to bind to that receptor, that receptor must already be doing something even without the drug. It's as if we're saying that the only thing that our drug molecules are doing to our receptors is changing the activity they already have, either to increase that activity or lower that activity. And that activity that that receptor inherently has is called in many textbooks as the constitutive activity. It's like, in, it's like intrinsic to them. It's like they are born with it, with or without any drug molecule. Now, as long as we meet these two requirements, then we could say that that receptor that we are discussing is a druggable receptor. That means that if I have a drug molecule that could interact with that receptor, we would expect some kind of effect in the person or the patient, okay? And when we do have a druggable receptor, we could now let drugs bind to them. I did mention a while ago that what you can do to the constitutive activity is either to up its activity or lower its activity. If I have drug molecules that up or increase that constitutive activity, then I could say that the drug I am using is called an agonist, okay?
So agon is like to agonize or like to sympathize or to improve what you already have. Now, if I have an enzyme, usually we would be better off calling the drug an activator instead. Though, most of the time we use receptor as the term, so it's more common to encounter the word agonist. Now, there are some drugs that either maintain that constitutive activity, that is, uh, not lower it, but also prevent it from going up. And there are very, 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 is that enough varies? Another very low frequency of uh, drugs that lower activity in the first place, which we call antagonists, right? To antagonize means basically to fight. Okay, so they're like, no, we're not allowing you to improve your activity or in even rare cases, no, we're not allowing you to increase the activity, we will even lower you down. Now, if we are talking about enzymes, um, those that do antagonist-like activity are, are more properly called inhibitors, okay, which in fairness is a very popular term in pharmacology texts. Now, since we are talking here things uh, about uh, things like activity and whatnot, of course, it's better to imagine it as a quantitative value, right? Like the fact that it can go up or it can go down means that maybe it's better for us to understand it if we actually have a graph. So allow me to present this graph to you. So here in the y-axis, I have activity units. So we can have imaginary activity units regardless of what activity that is. So it can be, you know, a reduction in blood pressure. It could be uh, improvement in the heart rate. It could be um, uh, it could be a lowering of body temperature, lowering of pain, and we could go from zero percent to one hundred percent. Okay, and then let's say that these are the activity units of a certain receptor X. Okay, so activity units of X. Of course, remember your receptor must always have an activity that's uh, higher than zero. It must have some kind of activity, which we call again as the constitutive activity. So, since I start here, my starting point here is this level, so I could say that uh, from 0 to, uh, let's just assume that this is 50% activity. This 50% activity from the get-go is that receptor X's constitutive activity, meaning at this point, we're not actually having any drug at all. No agonist, no antagonist, it's just the pure receptor working on its own. Now, of course, the moment that you add an agonist or antagonist from this flat 50%, that 50% should move somewhere. Now, if I do add an agonist, remember an agonist is supposed to increase that activity. So from 50%, it should steadily go up to some level. Of course, how far it goes would depend on how powerful the medication is. So it would go probably 60, 70, 80, and in very uh, in, 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 in cases of very powerful drugs, even all the way to 100%. Of course, that is expected if I have, uh, if I have, sorry, and, and I should be looking at the green one, right? This is in the case of pure agonist. Now, if I do add an antagonist, and I mentioned this a while ago, most of our antagonists do not lower the activity, but they also prevent the activity from going up. And I think... Uh, for people who are watching this, just to review for pharmacology, a lot of people are getting this wrong because I think even I am part of uh, this population before. Um, when we say antagonize, oh, you're fighting, so you must probably be uh, you, lowering the activity. That's not actually correct. Now look at my red dashed line here. You see that from 50%, when I added an antagonist, our activity actually just got stuck at 50%. And this is what I was talking about. You have an antagonist just to prevent that 50% constitutive activity from going up. So look at this. If you want to know what will happen, hey, what will happen if I add this and this at the same time? Look at this. For example, I added an agonist. And then, of course, we said agonist, so you know the effects going up. But the moment that you add an antagonist, let's say at this point, then notice what happens. The activity, this is the amount of activity that was raised by the agonist, right? When I have an antagonist added to that, what does the antagonist do? It prevents the activity, the constitutive activity from going up. So now, if we say, oh, the antagonist is like, oh, you increased the activity this much, I'm going to lower that back down to 
because that's my job okay and the i didn't even display this kind of effect wherein i really want to go down because it's very 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 rare now because of the nature of our antagonists wherein all they want to do is to just prevent you from going up okay the term that we often encounter for most antagonists is neutral antagonist why because they keep it flat you're not going up but you're also not going down okay so one thing that I also must uh, tell you about uh, analyzing these graphs is that if you go back to our biochemistry uh, discussion on enzyme kinetics, now if you have uh, forgotten its uh, con uh, content, you can go to my video on that. Um, but if you do, then look at this. Remember, this is the michaelis menten plot. It's supposed to have this shape because it's saturable, right? And on the x-axis, we have the substrate concentration. And then on the y-axis, we have the level of efficacy. Uh, actually, in, in, in enzyme kinetics, this is the, just the amount of uh, 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 molecules or products generated. However, since this is a pharmacology uh, discussion, we will now replace this. We don't call the molecule, uh, the ligand anymore as a substrate. We now call this the drug. So maybe we could just replace it by C, meaning concentration of the drug. And then let's just retain the letter E here, which we will not just call as the effect, okay? Or how much the drug is working. And of course, we know as a fact that as I increase the concentration of my drug, the effect goes up until it reaches a certain point wherein at this point, all the receptors are saturated. And with, if we trace this maximum activity here, we will now call this as the Emax. Of course, if you get half of that Emax, go back to the uh, Michaelis menten plot and then draw a line down to the uh, x-axis. This used to be called the Km or the Michaelis constant, but in pharmacology, we will replace that as the Kd, meaning the dissociation constant. Okay. Now, furthermore, if you want to be more technical about this, uh, the Emax is sometimes uh, replaced by Bmax, meaning maximum binding, because we say that at the point of saturation, which is this one, all of my enzymes, or sorry, all of my receptors have been bound by some kind of drug, okay? Now, also, in pharmacology texts, we rarely encounter a normal plot like this, but instead use a semilog graph, okay, wherein... Instead of putting the x-axis as just concentration, we will convert it to the logarithm of the concentration. That will effectively shift the hyperbolic shape of this graph into a sigmoidal one. But the good news is that the analysis is pretty much the same, meaning um, if this used to be the Emax or the Bmax before, it still is here. And then in order to plot the KD, we just do the same exact thing. Okay, It's just a little more you know, sigmoidal or S-shaped. Now, going further in our discussion in agonists, on agonists and antagonists, I want to give you a variety of different plots showing you how did the agonist and antagonists fare with each other. A while ago, I only showed you one graph for an agonist, but here I'm showing you two. That is because, remember a while ago I told you um, how much our agonist would increase the activity depends on how powerful that antagonist is. That is, there are agonists that are more powerful, we often call them as full agonists, and then th there are those that are less powerful or what we call as partial agonists. By definition, of course, any agonist would increase the constitutive activity. So like if this was 50%, anything beyond 50 would be uh, an agonist effect. So I don't know, maybe if this was, I don't know, if this was like 75%, that's still an increase in activity. So a partial agonist will still increase the activity, but not to that maximum point. If I do have a drug that does that, now we would give that term, or we would give that drug the term full agonist. Of course, the meaning of full and partial are evident here. Of course, I also mentioned a while ago that most of our antagonists are neutral antagonists, which is why the plot for a neutral antagonist is basically a flat line continuing the constitutive activity. And then there's this 
thing I've been mentioning a while ago, right? That there are very, 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 very rare cases of antagonists that actually lower the constitutive activity. And that's uh, this is actually how it will look like in the plot if there was something like that. Drugs or molecules that do that very rare uh, uh, effect are called inverse agonists. Because if I have an agonist that would increase the activity, an inverse agonist basically does that. But, you know, this is really a confusing term because a while ago I said, every time you use the word agonist, you increase the activity. However, because of the word inverse, meaning you just turn it inside out or upside down the definition, an inverse agonist actually falls as a legit antagonist, even worse than a neutral antagonist. This is why I often don't want to discuss this because depending on how you interpret it, it could be really confusing, but I still mentioned it here nonetheless. Now, just as a summary, what should we know about receptors, drugs, and their interactions at the moment? First, you should know that, again, a receptor must be specific and must have some kind of effect. If it meets those conditions, then it would be worth targeting by drugs and is called druggable. Now, if I have a drug that will target that druggable receptor, I could either increase its activity using agonists, again, except inverse ones, and then uh, I could also, most of the time, prevent its activity from going up by using antagonists. One last thing, I did mention that as long as my drugs, or sorry, as long as my receptors have these two properties, they could be called druggable. But how about those without any effect? Meaning a drug could interact with it, but even if my drug interacts with that protein or receptor, with nothing really happens. There are receptors like that, and they're kind of like nuisance, like, like uh, what, what's my drug doing with this? It's not, it's not even giving me any result. Those receptors are called silent receptors. And uh, of course, uh, most of the time, our goal is to not hit those silent receptors because there's no point in doing so. And silent receptors will also complicate the graphs that we have been witnessing so far, but I think I would reserve that in a future recording.